Welcome to the last in our current series of Kits and Cruising, and this week we leave these gentle shores and head back to France with the Silver Register. We also have highlights of some pretty fast laps in a Silver Striker, and we even get glimpses of some of the cars you can expect to see in the next series. Now I've had a few good drives myself this year, and here are a few highlights, and a few outtakes, and the fabulous Foreman Can-Am. Right, Neil. I've got my foot on the brake. <laughs> a few weeks ago on the show, you may remember, we encountered the Foreman. It's a classic replica, basically kind of recalling the style of the late 60s supercars. If you remember the likes of the Ford GT40 and those beautiful, sexy, swoopy Ferraris. And this car recalls that era very much. And I didn't drive it on the programme then. We thought we'd leave that, tease you a bit, and we're going to drive it today. And that's not something you take lightly. This thing weighs less than a thousand kilos. It's got 375 brake horsepower from a small block Chevy V8. That's a lot of engine, it's a lot of car. And so starting this thing actually has quite a sense of occasion to it. There's several things to do. Having checked we're in neutral, I don't want to fire myself into the next county. I lift this rocker switch here, flick my ignition to on, put my fuel pump on, and uh, it chocks away. And then we press the best button of all. Listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Even a sound like that, it's just something that gorgeous cannot possibly be legal. Obviously it's as direct as you would expect. There's nothing between you and what's going on. The clutch is seriously competition heavy. I'm going to push it along to the left, but not too far to the left. We don't want to go into reverse by accident. That would be very, very, very bad. I've got to reach down here. I have to excuse me a moment to get that handbrake off. Uh, uh. Don't forget, this isn't a case of somebody saying, oh, it's a bit like a race car and it's on the road. This is a race car on the road. Of course, there's one thing we've forgotten here. <laughs> uh, now, I'd like you to tell me any way in which you can have more fun than with this. the feel, everything about this thing. This really is the real thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. Despite the size, it looks huge. As soon as you get in it, it shrinks around you. It really does shrink to fit. And that has got to be the sign of a seriously well-sorted car. You become instantly aware of where the wheels are, instantly aware of where the center of gravity is. 
instantly aware of what's under my right foot and you uh, better not get carried away. <laughs> the controls are an absolute delight. Rigid and tense and taut all the time, informing you of what's going on. But unbelievably, they're not heavy. Which, when you consider the amount of power that they're controlling, that's quite an achievement. Well, as always, of course, underneath all the glamour of such a thing, there has to be reality that things have to be built. This is one of the places where that takes place. The company's about five years old. The man behind it is Neil. Uh, five years, so it's actually quite a fresh venture, really, when you think about it. Well, I bought my first P4 from the original manufacturer ten years ago, yeah. and I built it as a customer. And we actually took over the project five years ago. We spent two years redeveloping the thing from the ground up. New chassis, new mould, new geometry. And we took it from there, and uh, two years ago we started developing the Can-Am and launched that last year, and that's been received very well throughout um, the world. Boy, have you ended up with something. But it's engineering as well, I mean, we, we've spoken before. That's and you, right. You... I, I served an apprenticeship with Marconi building mm. um, aircraft back in the days with the TSR2 and uh, the, the prototype Concorde. I worked on Nimrod's Jaguars. So I served my engineering apprenticeship um, with the best and I learned the trade from there. From then on, I spent some time in entertainment. I was going to say, because you'll kill me for bringing that in, <laughs> but it's true, because despite your engineering background, and that shows through, I suppose, and the sincerity, the integrity of the product, the passion of that is reflected in your own career as well, because you were in the entertainment industry, which I, yeah. I don't understand how that transition was made. But. Well, I, I started off, as a lot of young people do, in a, in a band mm. playing pop stuff uh, from the age of 14. Mm. That progressed to a comedy show, and I was working in a comedy band for 25 years, mostly doing military stuff and uh, entertaining the troops. Mm. And um, that's where the finance came. I was gonna, you kind of squirreled away all your cash and then you, you come here and yeah, build these things. That's right. Can't be a bad kind of existence. Where do you want to go next with it? We want to develop the product and it's, no, it's never finished. Um, we always look at improving the product, improving the panel fit, the quality, um, and the, the end product for the customer. Um, if we can improve it and bring out maybe another model. Of course, sitting on the sidelines, it's very difficult to get an idea of the excitement in car. Well, now you can sit back and enjoy because we hitched a lift in a silver striker that had been scorching around the track all day. Bear in mind that this is virtually a standard road car and that during this run we were timed as the second fastest lap of the day, one minute and ten seconds. Just keep an eye on the keys to get an idea of how fast he was pushing it. Enjoy.
in part two, our intrepid owners head back home. Virginia Baker has been to Rotherham in Yorkshire seeking out some interesting cars and their owners. Now, the producer said to me that this week we'd be going off to Rotherham to try and find something just a little different, and he wasn't wrong. This is Tony. Tony, you're going to have to tilt me around this car. Right. It's absolutely fab. Thank you. It's a 1956 Chevrolet station wagon, shipped into England about two years ago. Wanted a full uh, restoration on it. I didn't want to take it back to uh, original. I've already uh, tried that once before with uh, another car I had. Right. And uh, I got fed up with just driving, driving it out at garage, polishing it and what have you. So I wanted to do something different with one. And right. uh, various uh, photographs, what I'd seen and ideas I'd gotten, I thought I'd just give it a go like and see what it turns out like. How long did it take to build? Uh, approximately 12 months. Really? Uh, Stick is, at it. Is know. that an average time to build a car? No, like it's I'm I'm the type of guy that I can't stand having a car in garage uh, when things won't need doing to it. Like you know, so I just want to get stuck into it and get it back on the road as quick as I can. Some guys take a lot longer. You know, it's, it's you know, every individual's different. You know. It looks <coughs> brand new. Was it expensive? Uh, the car itself wasn't expensive to buy. Uh, I found it in California two or three years ago like uh, like I say I wanted a full restoration so it wasn't too bad price wise by the time I got it back in England it stood me around about £3,000 really that's alright isn't it for a and then car like this started buying things for it and price soon so like, from, so from start to finish you're going to be very rude and ask you from start to finish how much did it cost you um, and your wife's not listening I should say it stands me around about nine or ten grand could have bought a brand new Fiesta for that. Yeah, but that uh, appreciates out. and uh, <laughs> it had a lost price of Fiesta in 12 months time so I'd sooner be driving this than a Fiesta. And what was your first car that you built? It was a 1955 Chevrolet four-door Bel Air which I took back to original and uh, I enjoyed it like I got fed up with it like <laughs> after that I, uh, I built a 1947 Ford that fended rod, hot rod, and then I sold that and <laughs> bought this. So I'm happier when I'm building them. It's quite a head turner, isn't it? Do yeah. so you get many comments from people when you're driving around? Oh yeah, I mean this is first year it's been on road and uh, it gives you a buzz, you know, when you're driving it and you can see people staring and turning and pointing. Definitely gives you a buzz. <laughs> Our boys are racing across France now to make the ferry and we're in car with stylus owner Robert.
Once again, whenever we stopped, the curious locals swarmed around the cars. It's very original cars. Yes. <laughs> And uh, I look at them because I have a friend who, who got a similar car, mm -hmm. and uh, it remembers uh, for it me. Reminds all, it reminds you. It reminds you of so uh, uh, cars uh, I've seen when I was young because oh, there nice. were many little cars oh. uh, built in France uh, or yeah. uh, in several other countries, and. Uh, I like this kind of, yes. uh, of cars. Okay, yeah. I would like to, to have one. <laughs> Can I have a make a round with? <laughs> Very beautiful. <laughs> and it's uh, uh, often you, you are in a team. Yes. And uh, all the all the people know them and yes. uh, like to to, to go to to have yes. a. Uh, around or on yes. the other countries. All together, uh, yes. All together, <laughs> yes. Robert, how are we doing? Well, above us is the first bit of blue sky we've seen on the, over the weekend, but that hasn't detracted, of course, from the fun of it all, by any means. However, it's nice to have that above us. Um, we're on the uh, run for Calais at the moment to get the 4.30 ferry. We have to be there at 10 to 4. It's now 13 minutes past 3. We've got about 40 miles to do. Now, if you take notice, if you see what the speedometer is showing, there's about 130 at the moment, but uh, the rev counter is suggesting that it couldn't, it might be slightly inaccurate. We're doing about 70 miles an hour in top gear. We're trying to keep a fairly tight convoy together here, so uh, the French don't uh, break us up too much, but quite honestly, the road is very clear. Very smooth, nice road this. It is the Hayage road. Tell us a little about your car. This car was finished in June, so uh, it hasn't done that many. It's actually done about 4,000 miles now. Um, but that was a great experience, especially as it started off fairly slippery and slowly started to dry out a bit. That gave you the learning curve at the beginning about sliding around and then slowly it tightened up and we could do a bit more speed. But unfortunately, Later on in the afternoon, it got wet again. How often do you use it? Certainly use it every weekend. I get through a tank full of fuel, about five gallons every weekend. And if I can't find anything to do, specifically anywhere to go, I just drive around and enjoy it. Is it expensive to own and run? Reliability depends on your build quality, really, and what you know, uh, how many you've built, how good you are at creating the whole car. Most people aren't skilled at the whole operation. Some people are more mechanically minded, some people are more body minded, design minded. My weakness probably is in the electrical side of it. It took a bit of a struggle to put it together. And uh, clearly we um, need to do a bit of more work on that side of it to get the reliability up on that front. So to the end of another series of kits and cruising, but don't worry because we will be back in June and here's a quick taster of what you'll see. Until then, from all of the team, very best wishes.